coming to a conclusion uh, in the book of Judges. Beginning with verse 1 of chapter 20. Uh, we taught, we preached to you this morning the 19th chapter of the book of Judges. And we pray that God will bless you. Amen. Amen. The preaching of His Word. Verse 1, it says, Then all the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together as one man from Dan even to Beersheba, with the land of Gilead unto the Lord in Mizpah. And the chief of all the people, even of the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 footmen that drew the sword. Now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel were gone up to Mizpah. Then said the children of Israel, Tell us, how was this wickedness? And the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came in to Gibba, that belongeth to Benjamin, I and my concubine to lodge. And the men of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about upon me by night and thought to have slain me and my concubine have they forced that she is dead. And I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel for they have committed lewdness and in, in folly in Israel. Behold, ye are the children of Israel give hear your advice and counsel. The people arose as one man saying, We will not any of us go to his tent, neither will any of us turn into his house. But now this shall be the thing which we shall do to give you. We will go up by the lot against it. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy words. We give you all the glory and the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. All right. In the 19th chapter, beginning with verse 1, the Bible says, It came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, lays the foundation for what is being said in these chapters. In chapter 21, verse 25, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. We have the same statement in Judges chapter 16 and verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And then chapter 18 verse 1, In those days was there no king in Israel. So we see uh, this refrain is given to us four times so that we understand what is going on in the time of the judges. The problem is is that everybody is doing that which is right in their own eyes. They have not recognized a king or a lord over them, and it is creating major problems. In the 17th chapter, we saw last Sunday how that there is a spiritual problem, a religious problem that begins to take place in the house of Micah. I'm not going to re-preach that tonight. Uh, but from Micah, his apostasy, we see a man come who's a Levite. He puts his official stamp of approval on the apostasy that is in Micah's house. So now it has moved from apostasy in the house to apostasy in an official way. And then from there we see that there is a tribe called the tribe of Dan and they go to war uh, with some basically innocent Canaanites up in the northern part of the Galilee. So what we have is apostasy in a house, apostasy in an official way, and then apostasy in a tribe. Because everybody's doing that which is right in their own eyes. This is the pattern that we have. We have spiritual failure that is taking place. This is what happens whenever a church, a community of people begin to do what's right in their own eyes where there is no king that is governing their life, then problems begin to take place. Spiritual failure takes place. And we preached to you that last uh, couple of weeks ago. Amen. Now, we came to the 19th chapter this morning and we saw following spiritual failure or spiritual confusion. You always have moral failure or moral confusion. And so we see in the, the 19th chapter, we preached it to you this morning, 
we saw a woman, a concubine, nameless concubine, get into a fight with her nameless Levite husband. She goes to her daddy's house in Bethlehem, Judah. She stays there for four months. The Levite decides, I'm going to go get her. She's not coming back home on her own. I'm going to go and get her. And so he goes over to Bethlehem, Judah, and he enters into his father-in-law's house. They have a big old celebration because the father-in-law is glad that the son-in-law has come to get his daughter slash amen wife to take her back home. We preached that to you this morning. Now, the Scripture says after four days, he makes his journey back over to um, Bethlehem. No, where to? To Ephraim where he is from. Now, from Bethlehem, Judah, over to Ephraim. The Scripture tells us that he takes his journey late in the evening with poor timing. And he makes his way as he's going back home. I preached it to you this morning. I'm not going to re-preach it, but just kind of catch you up, all the rest of you. He's making his way back home. He's on his way. And it's the sun goes down. It's dark. He recognizes, he realizes that he needs to find a place to sleep. And so he comes to Jebus, which the Bible tells us is Jerusalem. Jebus is controlled by the Canaanites. It's not an Israelite city. So he says to his servant and to the concubine, we're not staying here. We're going to go over to Benjamite territory, some brothers and sisters that we have, and we'll stay there in Benjamin. Are you all here with me today at this point? Because they're our brothers. They'll take care of us. Now, we preached that to you this morning. You'll remember uh, he decides to go through Jebus. He goes all the way to Gibeah of Benjamin. And the Scripture tells us that there's no place for him to stay. And so he's out in the open square of the city. And then an old man comes out of the field at night time and invites him into his house. And they're having a time of fellowship and, and food and merriment. And then all of a sudden, disaster hits. Up to this point, this man, this Levite, has been led by his brainwaves. What he thinks is right in his own eyes. He left late. He should have left earlier. Now it's dark. They need to find a place to stay. He doesn't stay in Jebus. He keeps going to Giba, thinking that that's the better solution. And with time, we'll find out that his brainwave is going to succumb to an understanding that you don't do things in your own eyes. You have to do what is pleasing to God. So anyway, the long story short, he's sitting there with the old man. The concubine's there. The old man's daughter's there. And here comes the sons of Belial. The sons of Satan. These are evil, wicked men. The Bible talks about sons of Belial being like murderers, rapists, people that are not thankful. Uh, false witnesses, on and on it goes, people who turn people's hearts away from God into idolatry. These are all known as sons of Belial. Here they come to the door. And the man, the Levite and his concubine, and the old man and his daughter's there. And they beat down the door and they say, we want to know this man. That means they wanted to have homosexual relationships with the Levite. And we want to know his concubine. We want to have sexual relationships with his wife. In violation of the Scripture, homosexuality. In violation of the Scripture, adultery. You get the point. In order to keep this from happening, in order for the man, the Levite, not to be um, violated this way, the old man says to these evil men, we will take and give to you the concubine and my daughter. And you can do whatever you want to do with these women, but just leave this man alone. The Bible says they wouldn't go for that. They didn't agree with that. And so the Scripture says the Levite came and took his concubine and threw her to the dogs of that city. The Bible says those dogs, those men, raped her, gang raped her. Pardon me, I just got to tell you the truth. They gang raped her all night long and they abused her. And the Bible says just before sunrise, she finds herself at the door of the old man's house where her husband, the Levite, was staying. She collapses at the threshold of the door. 
The Bible doesn't tell us that she dies at that point. But she's there. She's collapsing the Levite. So cold, unkind, and unloving. Opens the door, sees his wife there that have been abused all night long by these men. She, he simply looks at her. He doesn't say, can I help you? I care about you. Let me see if you're all right. He just looks at her and says, get up and let us go on our way. No compassion for this woman. No compassion for this wife whatsoever. The Bible tells us he puts her on the donkey. He takes her to his house in Ephraim. And when he gets there, he takes that woman's body, his wife, and he cuts her into 12 pieces. I'm not sure if she was even dead when he took her home. It's very possible that this Levite even murdered his own wife. This is what happens when everybody does that which is right in their own eyes. We have a quarreling that caused her to leave her husband to begin with. We have an ongoing social problem here where there's nobody opening the doors for somebody to come and stay. We have a moral problem here where a woman is violated and raped all night long because somebody's doing that which is right in their own eyes in the nation of Israel. And there she is. And he does this horrific thing by cutting her body parts into 12 pieces. Why would he do that? Well, this is the way, yeah, oftentimes, if you're going to gather an army, if there's an outrage that has taken place, and you're going to gather an army to help you to remove evil or something that has been done that's very wrong, and you need an army to go to war with uh, a situation, then you'll cut that person or the animal up and send it throughout the nation so that when the people see the parts, they are literally shocked into movement they are shocked into taking action against the evil that is in that city or that location and so the Bible tells us this man cuts her in pieces and sends him sends her body parts to the twelve tribes of Israel and obviously when those body parts begin to arrive they begin to be shocked about the, at the outrage what has happened to this woman why has she been cut up like this what has taken place? And the Bible tells us that the Levite begins to explain to them what happened. And that brings us to the message tonight. The children of Israel being in shock as to what has happened, they gather as one man from Dan even to Beersheba with the land of Gilead and to the Lord of Mizpah. And the chief of all the people, even all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 footmen that drew the sword. See, they were moved into action by what they saw. The outrage of this man having been slain. Or this woman having been slain. 400,000 footmen gather. And the Levite begins to explain to them what had happened. The Bible tells in verse 3, the children of Israel heard, the, uh, the children of Benjamin heard the children of Israel were gone up to Mizpah. Then said the children of Israel, tell us how was this wickedness? Israel wants to find out how did this happen? And then they require that Benjamin turn over these evil men that committed this atrocity. They required it. And the Bible says these, that Benjamin says, we're not turning these evil men over to you. And so as a result of that, the nation of Israel, the other tribes, the other 11 tribes are going to go to war with Benjamin, their brother. Now notice what the Levite says in verse 4. The Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came into Gibeah that belongeth to Benjamin, I and my concubine to lodge. And the men of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about upon me by night and thought to have slain me and my concubine have they forced that she was dead. And I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel for they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. Said the Levite. What a hypocrite he is. He should have defended his wife. He should have been the one that says, no, you... You're not going to take my wife to those evil men. I'll 
stand in her place, but he didn't do that. Here he comes sort of a hypocritical way in a self-righteous way. You know, that I want something taken care of here. I want something right to be done here. He's nothing but a hypocrite. He's a very cold man who didn't care about his wife. And now the Bible tells us she is dead. So he comes up with a very brief statement as to what had happened. And then he steps off the scene. We don't hear from him anymore. The Bible tells us as the Israelites seek for those evil men and Benjamin to be brought forth, Benjamin says, we're not turning them over. We're not going to give them to you. And so the Scripture tells us what happens then. The Bible lets us know that Israel begins to go to war with Benjamin. They go to war and three different battles take place. And the first time they go to war, go to battle with Benjamin, they ask God, who's going to go first? And God says, you send Judah. And so Judah goes forth. The 400,000 men go against this little small army of Benjamites, a little over 20,000, I believe, soldiers, and then 700 skilled men, and then 700 Benjamites that can sling the slingshot with their left hand. Just a small army. It goes out to fight 400,000 men in Israel. The first attack from Israel, Judah leads the war. The Bible tells us that they are defeated. Twenty, little over 20,000 soldiers defeat an army of 400,000. The second war, they go out and fight. They take the same steps. They go through the process. They go out to fight the little small tribe of Benjamin. And what do you know? The small tribe of Benjamin defeats a second time the larger, the larger group of Israel. And so Israel goes to God. They said, we got to figure this out. We don't understand why we have an army of 400,000 men and we're going against our little army of 20,000. We keep getting defeated, keep getting whipped. We can't figure it out. So the Bible says they do something different. They go and get the ark of God over in the shallow and they bring it over to Bethel. And they stand before the ark of God and there is a priest that is called by name. Nobody in these passages, in these passages, is called by name with the one exception, the priest. And that priest stands in the presence of God in that throne room, recognizing him to be the king. And when he does that, when the nation does that, recognizes that Jesus, that God is the king, and they're asking for him to bring divine judgment on that situation. The Bible says when they go to war the third time, that they destroy, they defeat the army of the Benjamites. Because now God's throne, God's rulership is put in its rightful place and now victory has come. They're no longer doing that which is right in their own eyes, but they're doing it God's way and God is the King and God is being recognized as the King. And so now they go forth and they are victorious in their life. When you and I put God in His rightful place, victory will begin to come to our lives again until we have God in our rightful place in his rightful place and we continue to do things in our own eyes the way we think it ought to be done then what will happen is no matter what the odds are we'll always be defeated but when you put God in his rightful place an army of little over 20,000 soldiers can defeat an army of 400,000 if God is on his throne as long as you keep doing what's right in your own eyes there will be failure that will come but get God in his rightful place and when God passes judgment then the victory will come do you understand that and the Bible tells us they completely defeat you can read the story in the 20th chapter completely defeat the Benjamites Wipe them out to the point that they flee over. Are y'all with me here today? They flee over. Let me repeat myself. Did I, maybe I didn't explain myself. Israel has won the victory over the Benjamites because they put God in His rightful place. The Benjamites have fled to the rock of pomegranate or to the pomegranate rock. There's about... A group of them and they're defeated there. But there's 600 Benjamites that are left. That's it. 
600 men. We have a problem here. Whenever the judgment comes to go and fight the Benjamites and to defeat them, according to the Word of God, because the Benjamites did not or turn over the wicked or the evil that was in their midst, they should be defeated, they should be wiped out. And their city completely destroyed. There are 600 of them that are left. The Bible tells us after this civil war, we now have national confusion that comes into the assembly. 600 men. Israel begins to feel sorry for this little small tribe that they have just about wiped out and blotted out off of the earth. The Scripture tells us that what the problem is is that there's no women for these 600 men to marry. We have a bigger problem because the Israelites, the, the rest of the nation of Israel said they went to the to Mizpah where the Lord was. There was some kind of shrine there unto the Lord. They went to Mizpah and they made an oath to God that they would not marry or allow any of their daughters to marry a Benjamite. And so we got 600 men with no woman to marry. We've got 600 men where Israelite says, I will not let my daughter marry a Benjamite because of their evil. The Israelites begin to feel sorry for that one tribe of Benjamin. That little tribe is about wiped out. And so the Scripture tells us this confusion comes in verse 1, chapter 21. Now the men of Israel had sworn in Mizpah, saying, There shall not any of us give us give his daughter unto Benjamin to wife. When did they do that? When they stood before the Lord at Mizpah. Verse 1 of chapter 20. And the people came to the house of God and abode there till even before God and lifted up their voices and wept sore and said, O Lord God of Israel, why has this come to pass in Israel that there should be today one tribe lacking in Israel? Israel begins to weep. They are the ones that have gone to fight with their brother and defeated their brother in battle over this wickedness that was taking that taken place there concerning this concubine. And now when they look at this small tribe that's about to be completely wiped out, there's only 600, something happens to them. They begin to feel sorry for that small little tribe. They begin to weep before the Lord. Why was the weeping taking place? Were they weeping because they had been whipped twice? Or were they weeping in a sentimental way because they are guilty of having just about wiped out one of their tribes? The Bible says as they weep, today one tribe is lacking in Israel. They feel sorry that right now they're about to wipe out a tribe completely. And they know because of an oath that's been made that none of their daughters can marry any of those 600 men that are left. And so in their grief and in their sorrow, they begin to try to come up with a plan. An oath has been taken by the men of Israel not to allow their daughters to marry any Benjamite. How are we going to come up with a solution that will allow Benjamin to continue? How are we going to come up with a solution that will allow Benjamin to marry some of the daughters of Israel? And they come up with a legal plan that enables them to release some women. They make a search through the land of Israel and they find out, hey, maybe there's somebody in Israel that did not take that oath that they would not allow their daughters to be married to a Benjamin. Maybe there's somebody in the land that would allow, that didn't take that. And so they make the search and they find out when they do. There was a group of people that did not take the oath. Amen. Verse 10, the congregation sent to their 12,000 men of the valiantness and commanded them saying, go and smite the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword with the women and the children. See, they found out that Jabez Gilead 
didn't go up to the to Mizpah and didn't make that covenant there at Mizpah, which was we will not allow our daughters to marry a Benjamite. They found out one little city, Jebus Gilead, had not made that vow. And because Jabesh Gilead did not go up with the body when they were called, when they were gathered, the Bible tells us now they come under the judgment of God. And Israel takes an army and they go to war and they fight the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead. And they kill the men of the city. And they make a decision. They say, hey, the men of the city didn't vow that they would not allow their daughters to be married to a Benjamite. So we'll kill them all and we'll take their daughters and we'll give them to the Benjamites. See, it'll be on a technicality. It'll be legal that we can take those virgins of that city and we can give them to the Benjamites because they, they didn't take the vow unto God that they would not do so. Legally it was right, but morally it was wrong. You understand what I'm saying? And so the Bible tells the story that 400 virgins are found in Jabesh Gilead, but there's 600 Benjamite men. 400 virgins. The Bible says that they took those 400 virgins and they gave those virgins to the sons of Benjamin. Let's read the story. Verse 12, They found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins that had not known man by lying with any male, and they brought them unto the camp to Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. See, we've got to make this look legitimate. We've got to make this look like it's got... A backing. So they took them to church. 400 virgins. We've got to make it look like what we're doing is right. The Bible says they get them there. They consecrate these 400 men, the women. And the Scripture tells us in verse 13, the whole congregation sent some to speak to the children of Benjamin that were in the rock, Ramon, and to call peaceably unto them. And Benjamin came again at that time, and they gave them wives which they had saved alive of the women of Jabesh Gilead, yet so they, so they sufficed them not. And the people repented them for Benjamin because that the Lord had made a breach in the tribes of Israel. Then the elders of the congregation said, How shall we do for wives for them that remain? Seeing the women were destroyed out of Benjamin. Verse 17, they said, There must be an inheritance for them that be escaped of Benjamin, that a tribe be not destroyed out of Israel. How be it? We may not give them wives of our daughters, for the children of Israel have sworn, saying, Curse be he that giveth a wife to Benjamin. And they said, Behold, there is a feast of the Lord in Shiloh yearly. Now, let's stop right there. What is going on here? They supplied 400 women out of Jabesh Gilead, virgins, but that only takes care of 400 Benjamite men. That means there's 200 men that still need wives. And so all of a sudden their brainwave kicks in. The elders have a thought. You know what? We can get around this. What we'll do is this. Is that when we celebrate a feast of the Lord, whether it be Passover, Pentecost, or Tabernacles, it is required that the men go up to the house of the Lord. And at that time, there's going to be women, young women that are going to go to the house of the Lord and they're going to dance and they're going to worship God there at the house of the Lord. And when they come, we don't know what particular feast it is that's recorded here that they're going to do this at, but they came up with a plan. When these daughters come, We'll capture them. And we'll give them to Benjamin. We'll capture them. And, and technically speaking, the tribes won't be in error because the parents are not giving their daughters to a Benjamite. The Benjamites are capturing them, taking them. So on a technicality, 
they're going to come up with 200. And so the Bible says, at that time, the time of this feast, they're gathering there at the tabernacle. And they're dancing. These young women are dancing. And the Scripture tells us as soon as one of those men saw one of those women, they would run and they would... Now, you need to understand something here. There was an abduction taking place. See, legally they could do this. Legally, there's a loophole in the law. They had to find a loophole in the law. Israel made a vow that we're not going to give our daughters to the Benjamites, but we're going to find a loophole in the law. And the loophole is this. A Benjamite can capture a daughter and we'll have a loophole because we didn't give her. And so here they are. They're going up to worship God there. And all of a sudden, out of just nowhere, a man would run and grab a hold of one of those daughters and snatch her away like a wild animal taking prey. The word that's used here is a violent snatching away, a violent taking away of this young woman against her will. I mean, if you were a young woman and you're going to the house of God to worship, and then all of a sudden when you go to the house of God to worship, somebody jumps out and grabs you and pulls you away, takes you home, abducts you without your consent, you'd probably be screaming and hollering the whole way, let me go, let me go. But that's exactly what they did. Like a wild animal would sweep down and take a prey in its mouth and violently take it away. These Benjamites jumped out and grabbed 200 women and violently took them away while they were dancing. See, they had a solution to their dilemma. There was a shortage of 200 women and they had a loophole in the law. See, they wanted to make something right, but they didn't go according to the prescribed method. Amen? And so now the Bible tells us that these women are carried away violently and they have no rights to say no. How many of you young women here today, you've never been married, would like to be abducted like that? You're going to church to worship God, to praise God, and all of a sudden, a young man jumps out, grabs you, carries you off, carries you home, says, you belong to me. Put yourself in the shoes of these young women. That's what was happening to them. Now, some of you women say, yeah, go ahead. I'm all right with that. Go right ahead. No, no, not really. I know you're not like that. But that's what they did. They didn't have a choice in the matter, man. They were just snatched up, taken away like a, like a wild animal takes prey. Away. Amen. Maybe some of y'all would have said, here I am, take me. He said, uh, Isaiah says, here I am, send me. You say, here I am, take me. What I'm trying to tell you here is this. This is man's ways. This is, man, this is human approach. This is, this is man trying to find loopholes in God's law, law to make things happen, to cover up their insufficiencies. See, this is what happened when everybody does that which is right in their own eyes. You have loopholes that are given, loopholes that are used to bypass the law and the authority of God. When everybody does that which is right in their own eyes, you have abduction. Hallelujah. You have violence that take place. You have moral breakdown, social confusion, civil war, and national calamities. That's what happens. I don't think if you were a young woman that you'd like to be snatched away, taken away like that, would you? Amen. But that's what happened. Verse 19, Then they said, Behold, there is a feast of the Lord in Shiloh yearly in a place which is on the north side of Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goeth from Bethel to Shechem and on the south of uh, Lebanon. Therefore they commanded the children of Benjamin, saying, Go in and lie in wait in the vineyards and see and behold if the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance in dances. Then came ye out to the vineyards. 
and catch you every man his wife of the daughters of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin. And it shall be when their father or their brethren come unto us to complain that we will say unto them, see they're already thinking ahead. What's going to be the response of the brother or the father concerning their their daughter or their sister being abducted like this? They're already thinking, see they're using their brain. They will say unto, unto them, be favorable unto them for our sakes because we reserve not to each man his wife in the war. For you did not give unto them at this time that you should be guilty. See, you didn't violate your oath by giving your daughter to a Benjamite. They were taken by force. See the loophole here? It's not true justice. But that was their method. And the children of Benjamin did so, took them wives according to their number of them that danced, whom they caught, and they went and returned unto their inheritance and repaired the cities and dwelt in them. Oh, wow. See, that should have never happened. Because when the judgment of God came, the harem came upon Benjamin because of their evil and not turning over those evil men. And God sent that army of a hundred or four hundred thousand men to defeat them in battle. According to that law, they were supposed to wipe out the whole city of Benjamin and nobody was supposed to ever live there again. See, outwardly they have a form of godliness. Outwardly they appear like they're fulfilling and obeying the law, but they're finding a loophole here and a loophole there in order to get their way. That's what happens to people when they do things in their own brain power, with their own brain waves. They're always going to try to find a loophole in the laws of God. They took them and they dwelt in those cities. That was against the law of God for that to happen. Verse 24, And the children of Israel departed thence at that time, every man to his tribe and to his family. And they went out from thence, every man to his inheritance. And God says, In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And so in the 17th chapter, you have spiritual religious failure that leads to moral failure with the concubine, which leads to social confusion, civil war, national confusion. This is the pattern that takes place when you and I begin to not recognize God as King in our life. We begin to depend upon our own ability to make decisions and it will always, always produce some kind of confusion in the life. It never produces anything that's good. It's always going to produce death and murder and mayhem and chaos and the breaking of the law or setting up a loophole there. And I'm telling you right now that the book of Judges is a picture of the modern day church of Jesus Christ. Where everybody, not everybody, thank God, but in some cases, people are doing that which is right in their own eyes. And this is the why there is so much confusion in the church of the living God. Because they're not following the prescribed order. There's prescribed way of making things right with God. Everybody wants to do their own thing. Do it their way. They don't want the king to rule over their lives. They're willing to be, become Canaanites. The canonization of Israel has reached a very high level here. Spiritual failure, moral failure is all the results of becoming worldly and being a, a person who is now a Canaanite person who doesn't recognize God is the king. He was there the whole time. He was in Shiloh. They moved him to Bethel. Uh, they got the victory. And But now, again, the Scripture tells us the reason for their problems is because there was no king in Israel. Everybody did that which was right in their own eyes. The good news is this. In 1 Samuel, the Scripture tells us God is going to provide for the nation of Israel a king. 
And a man comes on the throne, on the scene. He's going to be the first on the throne. His name is Saul. Guess what tribe he's from? He's from the tribe of Benjamin. The first king of Israel is from the tribe of Benjamin. And then later on in history, we read about another man whose name was Saul of Tarsus, who we know to be Paul. Because that tribe was allowed to continue to exist. It produced a king and it produced an apostle. But the king that it produced, Saul, was not from the tribe of Judah. He was not God's choice. He was man's choice. And his kingship ended in disaster. But God says, I'm not going to leave it like that. My grace is going to shine. And I'm going to raise up another Saul who's called after the name of Saul of Kish. And I'm going to use that man Paul to bring Gentiles into the kingdom of the living God. I'm going, God says, I'm going to reverse the bad and make it turn out for the good because that's what God always does. He try, He steps in and what is bad, He says, I'm not going to let the light completely go out. I'm not going to let everything be destroyed. I'm going to step in and I'm going to reverse, if you will, the curse. I'm going to reverse the bad and turn it into good. And that's what he did with Saul. But in those kings, as those kings come, we have Saul, then we have David, then we have Solomon. If those kings come, you know what the Bible tells us? That God begins to remove those people like Eli. people like Eli and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, that are so much like the Canaanites in their dealings with man. God says, I'm going to remove them. And I'm going to set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Ultimately, that's speaking of Jesus Christ. As I close, as you stand, as I close tonight, let me say this to you. As you study the Word of God, chapter 17 through 21, you and I need to have in our minds and our hearts a desire not to become Canaanites. We need to have in our, des in our hearts a desire to worship and serve God in spirit and in truth and allow Him to begin to be the head of the church, to govern the church, to lead the church, and to direct the church so that there won't be confusion in the church or in your life. How many of y'all want to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Amen. Father God, we stand in Your presence right now and we ask Your blessing to be upon the reading and the preaching of Your Holy Word. Let us go forth always, God, with a desire that You be King of kings and Lord of lords. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for being here tonight.